TTI Chicago, so I think the first people, first thing people ask is, is, do we all drive Toyotas? Do we work for Toyota? And the answer is no. So TTI Chicago is an academic, a graduate level academic computer science institute located in the University of Chicago campus. So we have 10 tenure track faculty, 15 research track faculty, work in a variety of areas of, of computer science, primarily uh, computer science theory and machine learning with applications to among other things robotics. That's me. Uh, we have 30 graduate students. Toyota's in our name because Toyota gave us an initial money towards our endowment. It's TTI, but we don't do any research for. Uh, we do we do do some research for Toyota, but I'll, just like any other university, uh, we don't drive uh, Toyota. I don't drive Toyota. Uh, so yeah, so my my interest, my research interests more broadly are in, in enabling robots to interact, use perception to interact deliberately with in their environment. So taking in data from multimodal perceptual streams, vision, LIDAR, natural language, and use those to act deliberately. So what does that mean? Navigating in urban environments. I do a fair bit of work with assistive technology, so working on voice command of a wheelchair, so navigating around indoor hospital and long-term care facilities. I do some work with manipulation, so robots that are able to deliberately manipulate things in their environment, open refrigerators, open drawers, now working on the application for, for cooking surrogate for manufacturing. So but one of those areas is self-driving cars. And so I'm going to tell you a little bit about my interaction with self-driving cars dating back to mid-2000s. So this is a video of now what basically looks like a Frankenstein vehicle. This is the car that we developed at MIT, again in the mid-2000s, to compete in the DARPA Urban Challenge. I'm sure you've seen the Google cars now. They look nothing like this. They're much more stealth. Uh, this is our first stab at it. Okay, so again, a lot of this work, as with any of these big robotics projects, always, it, it couldn't, wouldn't be possible without a big team. So we had around 20 people, 20 to 30 people, depending on how you count, developing that car that you just saw in the video. So this laundry list of things here, our military is here the project. Um, so again, so now we all know what Google has done, and more recently dating back to 2009, but really where did it start? So DARPA, which is the Defense Advanced Research Project Agency, an arm of, the, of DOD, came up with a, was given a congressional mandate that in 2015, so last year actually, one third of all ground combat vehicles had to be automated. So this is when we were in Iraq, and there were a lot of incidents of IEDs blowing up transport. So a lot of what the military does is just moving things around, moving material from a port to, say, Baghdad. And the idea was, we can save a lot of soldiers' lives and we can automate that problem of going to point A to point B across the desert. So how DARPA was mandated with starting, spurring research in this area, and so the way that DARPA does this nowadays is by sponsoring competitions. So they had a competition in 2004, 2005, slide, to go from, again, point A to point B, about 140 miles in a desert-like environment, maybe similar to Baghdad, autonomously. And then, so they got participation from a variety of universities, but also a number of companies. So that was DARPA Grand Challenge 1. So the Barstow to Crim, I think it's in the Nevada Desert, again, March 2004, 142 miles, 10 hours. And then get people interested, they said they, were, they, were, they put a prize of a million dollars in first place. And then no team, no, we'll see in a bit, no team made, made, made it past several, I think it was 10 miles, 7 miles. So the second round of this, the rock rethought things was a little bit over a year later, October 2005, 132 miles, similar environment. They upped the prize a little bit, get more people interested, and we had a number of teams. So the first competition 
No team drove more than 7.4 miles. So this is one of the teams here rolling over. Um, so 7.4 miles was the most. You know, there are many teams that made it to zero miles. There was one person actually who decided, I don't know why, but he was going to make an autonomous motorcycle. <laughs> because driving a car is hard enough, let alone stabilizing a motorcycle. He was going to make an autonomous motorcycle. It drove, and he forgot to put turn on the stabilization controller. So it drove, and it fell. That was it. He entered the next competition. He's like, okay, I'll make something that can right the motorcycle. If it falls over, and he did that. And he made it a couple of miles. He ended up going on to work for it. I think he still works for Google. Very impressive what he did because he was one person. But anyway, so it was a really hard challenge. So they sponsored the second one, and you know they modified the course a little bit. But really, the goal was to go from point A to point B. They put some obstacles around the course. But there was no car-to-car -car interaction, and you had five teams finish. So Team Oshkosh out of Wisconsin. CMU had two teams that finished, despite one of them, I think, blowing a, a, a fuel pump failing. But the winner was Stanley. So this is Stanley. So Sebastian Thrun was the professor of the computer science, or the, the sale, the AI lab at Stanford. He led Stanford's team, building this uh, Volkswagen tour up. They made it in just under seven hours, averaging around 20 miles per hour. So some history. Sebastian went on to, among other things, start Google X. And he was the founder and leader for a long time of the chauffeur of the Google self-driving car project. And he's since moved on to, I think it's, at, I think it's Udacity now, a movement. Uh, a very, very prolific roboticist. Uh, also integral in Street View came out of a lot of the work that went into the branch. So that was navigating around a desert environment. Well, then, then, you know, going back to this motivation of you know, moving material, not just to Baghdad, but around Baghdad, the motivation was, or the goal was to get a robot car to drive around in an urban environment. So the work. It seems like we go from point A to point B, we can avoid stationary obstacles. How well can we do with dynamic obstacles? In particular, how well can we do with other moving vehicles? So in the first urban, in the first grand challenge, if you caught up to the car in front of you, they would stop it. It would become a stationary obstacle and you would just navigate around. Listen, we're not going to allow that anymore. We want you to drive around cities, avoid or sorry, uh, avoid obstacles, but obey traffic laws. So you had to stop at stop signs, stop at stop lights, you had to handle merges, deal with intersections, with precedents, etc. They're going to block the road. And they said, you know what, we might block GPS. Because in the first competition, every team was reliant on GPS. They basically made a very dense map of the environment, and they did GPS waypoint following, plus some obstacle avoidance. So the DARPA said, well, you know what, we're going to make it a little bit more interesting, and we're going to block GPS. How well can you navigate? That was the idea. So they gave you two files. One was this topology, basically, basically a map, like a Google map representation of the environment, and then a list of destinations you had to visit. You plug it into your, into your car, it would be the USB stick, the car supposed to go off and go. So for this, and then they up, well, the price is the same, in this case, $2 million for first, $1 million for second, half a million for third. They also, this now had seed funding, so I think it was 10 or 11 $1 million prizes to get teams started. So fortunately, we were one of the teams that got some money that helped us get going. They initially had 89 teams. And this is everywhere from universities to companies to, and someone like Anthony Lewandowski, you know, building a motorcycle, to a stereo, a stereo speaker company, Bellodyne, which has actually become, we'll see in a bit, become integral to what we can do now with self-driving cars, enter these competitions. So the key issue here was answering three questions. So where is the road? So where is it around me? And estimating where the road is not relying on GPS because they may block GPS. And you know what happens around now? When I would, one of the reasons I was late was I had trouble navigating around Chicago because GPS mobile. So it happens, right? It's a, real, it's a realistic event. Where are the static obstacles? Where are things that I cannot hit, cannot drive, or have to drive around? And where are the other vehicles most interestingly? Are there robotic cars? And they also have human-driven vehicles. And where are they going? So I know how to act. So the key issue was answering these questions despite the challenges of uncertainty. So the environment is such uncertain, you know, one reason being the GPS drops out, I'm um, uncertain in turn of other vehicles' location. I don't know the behavior of other vehicles. You know, maybe it's, you can argue, it's somewhat easy to predict how people drive. It's not at all easy to predict how other robots are going to drive. Uh, so predicting their behavior and their intent. And then they, we have to do this in 18 months from start to end. Building a car to completing the car. So this is the model of the environment. This is a, a satellite view of the environment in which we're operating. This shows you the map that we are given. 
So this is the topology. You have nodes for locations like intersections and destinations and parking lots. Edges denote the existence of a roadway between them. But you'll note that these edges are just, they're just linear. They don't really define the structure of the road. So in this case, you have an intersection here, and you have an intersection over there, or a, a, a node there. But the edge is saying that you can go straight from one to the other, but clearly you cannot do that. You have to follow the you have to, so you have to, you can't just go directly by the map or from GPS. And then the road, the environment itself was a mixture. So it was, it was an urban challenge, but really it was a suburb. So this is in Victorville, California. It was actually a suburb built up around a former, I think it was a Navy or Air Force base, ended up uh, being, uh, being abandoned. So that's the, the test site. But so it's paved road. You can see not all the roads were, were, were perfectly paved. They don't all have lane markings. They don't all have curbs. Some of it was also off-road. This is our vehicle navigating in an off-road section. And so we had to deal with things like one- and two-way roads, missing road paint, as I said, missing curbs, or, you know, but, and obeying traffic laws. But DARPA didn't want us to drive past it, right? They don't want you to go one or two miles per hour. That's safe. You could achieve the mission going one or two miles per hour, but that's really not effective for you. So they actually liked it if you drove a little bit aggressive. Videos depicting this, this is during the challenge, during the event. You have these manually driven cars here. They actually hired stunt drivers to be driving around, which you can't blame them with this big multi-ton vehicle coming at it. It's actually the vehicle that ended up being the house. Okay, so what was allowed? What was in scope? Passing moving vehicles. So again, they want you to drive aggressive. So if the car in front of you is driving slow, you're encouraged to pass them. You know, not pass a double yellow, but you could if necessary. Merging into traffic, parking in parking lots, not parallel parking, but normal lots in dirt roads, potholes. What was out of scope? So no pedestrians. So there were people watching this, but they were behind very large barriers. So you don't have to worry about detecting pedestrians, fortunately. Speeds were relatively minimal. Um, sorry, this should be a less than, not a greater than. Speeds less than, I think it was actually more like 35 miles per hour. You had to obey traffic, well, all the traffic laws. You had to yield the traffic, et cetera. Or sorry, you didn't have to obey. There were no traffic signals, rather. And there's no real difficult terrain. There are some potholes in the off-road section, but nothing ridiculous like the first two challenges. And I should say, if people have questions, you know, just shout. So I went over this. This is the, the representation of the environment. Um, for the sake of time, I'll speed up. So again, again, we had many, many people on our team with a variety of expertise, so mechanical engineers, uh, aeronautic, aeronautics engineers, computer scientists, Factors engineers, a whole variety of people with multiple expertise, mainly people from MIT. Draper Labs is a, is a, is a lab that was, was, was very closely affiliated, now is loosely affiliated with MIT that handles a lot of, handles a lot of defense work. And Olin College of Engineering, which is an undergraduate engineering college outside of Boston, I think it's maybe 10 years old, maybe a little bit less, so very new. They're the ones who basically built, the roboticized essentially the vehicle, made together with Draper. And then we had some other teams. This is the vehicle here. So it's a Land Rover LR3. So Ford owned Land Rover at the time. It might be an affiliation with Ford. So Ford says, we'll give you the car if you drive a Land Rover. If you use a Land Rover. So that's what we used. It obviously didn't look like this when we got it. We just threw a bunch of sensors on it. So the first thing we're going to do is make it what's referred to as drive-by wire, right? So the computer needs to be able to push the gas pedal to do the steering wheel, et cetera. So we had a company, EMC, that does this. They took it and they basically gave us a port that we can plug in. Our, the focus of our team was, you know, again, we had never done this before. Some of the other teams had competed in the first challenge. We didn't compete, we didn't, we didn't, we hadn't worked on a ton of this driving form. We didn't know what we needed in terms of sensor data. And really, there's no <coughs> sensor uh, uh, that, robots, that, that robots can use. So we threw a lot of different sensors out. They each have their advantages, as I'll speak to you. Okay. So a bunch of cameras, in this case, five cameras. We had 12, 12 sick laser range rides. And again, I'll show you what, these, what the data that comes out of these look like. We had 16. Uh, radar, and we had this one sensor that I mentioned, the speaker company Valadon. So this speaker company entered, I think it was the first or second competition, and didn't like the sensor technology that was available. They said, you know what, screw it, we're just going to make our own sensor. And they made the sensor uh, called Velodon. Uh, it's a great, excellent sensor. You'll see some of the data comes out of it. It's amazing. Much better than we get from the, the other sensors on board the vehicle. Much easier in many respects to, to parse. It's very expensive. It's around $100,000. Uh, but an excellent sensor. So fortunately, we were able to, you know, we were toying with the idea is we can get you know, essentially one of these, 
or we can get, you know, 20 of those. If we have 20 of those and two of them fail, okay, we can still operate. If we have one of these and it fails, we're hosed. So that's why we were a little hesitant to buy it, put all our eggs in one basket. Um, and we did have a GPS IMU because GPS wasn't always banned, or wasn't always blocked. So all this data, you'll see that I'll, I'll, speak, I'll talk about a little bit of the data rates, but there's a lot of data to chew, a lot of data to process. So we need a you know, significant uh, computational resources to chew on all this data. So we threw it, we had this 40 core compute cluster in the trunk, what you'd see in a server room. With you know 40 gigs, actually nowadays it's not really that much. You can buy a desktop computer that has 40 gigs of RAM. We have 40 gigs of RAM, gigabit Ethernet, several gigabit Ethernet that works to transmit this data across between the sensors of the computer. That's a lot to power. You can't just plug in something to your cigarette lighter and power all this. So we had to throw a well, we had to throw a generator in the back. Pack into the pack into the, uh, the gas tank, which is really not the safest thing to do. Um, but we hacked into the gas tank. We threw this generator in it. You know, again, this computer is made for a server farm. It's kept you know kept maybe sixty odd degrees. It's not made to be stuck in a car, especially not one operating in a desert. So we had to stick a two kilowatt air conditioner on the roof. That's the why it's turned into a Franklin stuff. Um, so it was a, a, a bit bit over the top. But we didn't know what we needed, right? Because sensing is the most important thing and the most challenging thing to autonomous driving. So we said, let's throw as many sensors at it as we can. And if we don't need one, so be it. But we're better off not needing a sensor at the end than, than needing a sensor that we don't have. Right? So, that was our so this is what it looks like in the back. So this mess of different wires. This is Steve, one of our engineers, an awesome, awesome engineer. We did a lot of the work here. It looks like a mess, but it's actually extremely organized. We had all of our, you know, our relays here. You guys can see me over there. So our, re our relays over here. We have power backups that could probably hold us for a couple minutes in case the generator failed. Here's the generator here. Here's a nice IMU here. Um, separate uh, car battery that has extra backup. That's what it looked like in the trunk. But surprisingly, you could run. You could still sit five people in this car, uh, believe it or not. Uh, so, yeah. So, this is a car we call a Talos. We had a number of, again, we, vision is extremely important as, as, as roboticists and more generally people working on computer vision. Vision is a really hard modality to interpret. But we, but we can still extract useful information from it. So we had five cameras using fire and wire. So four facing forward. So three of them with a fairly wide field of view. One with a very narrow field of view. And then one rearward facing. Rearward facing. We primarily use this for lane detection because most of the roads didn't have lanes. Right. And we know that the waypoint I want to go to is somewhere over there, but I don't know if the road does this or it goes straight. So what's a good cue? What we would do is we look for lane and lane paint, right? So that's what we do. These are the cameras. These are some of the images that come out of it. You can see this is the event here. It's pretty cool. We have this whole like audience of people watching. Um, it's a lot of fun. We had LIDARs. So LIDARs are probably one of the, not the oldest, but one of the most prevalent sensors that roboticists use. LIDAR, LIDAR, basically what it does is a sensor here, you can see, I think it's the company that makes probably the most widely used LIDAR. And what it does is it basically sends out a beam of light and gets a return, and that gives it a range and bearing. In this case, this sensor sends out 180 of them. So you've seen a stripe in a plane. They don't see anything below, they don't see anything above, but they, they're, they're very fast, they run 75 hertz. They can see about 70 meters away from the vehicle. Um, Reasonably dense. You get 180 readings. There are others that are that are 10 times as dense, or four or five times as dense as this. So we had a number of these. Again, they only see in a slice, so one of them is not enough. So we need a bunch of them. We use these primarily for detecting obstacles. So 61% of the obstacles were detected with these, with these sensors for detecting curves, which is also useful for figuring out where the road is going. Other vehicles, road hazards, like I said, off-road, there were some potholes. We wanted to detect them. So this is what the data looks like. So what I'm showing you, each one of these is one LIDAR. This is the line. In this case, the LIDAR is seeing the ground. These LIDARs over here are seeing the traffic barrels. These over here are seeing the cars. And so what we did with these, some of them were horizontal, so they, the, the, the viewing plane was horizontal. Some of them we canted downwards, what we call a push room configuration. So we can see the ground. Those were used for detecting hazards, like potholes. So I'll play this, and you can see these things move. So if you squint, you can start to pull things out of these, out of this, this data. You can see this car over here. You can see this other car. So you start building these up over time. You can actually build up essentially a 3D point cloud of it that's sparse, but a 3D point cloud of the object. You can start to you can start to get useful information. 
namely the location of objects, and maybe how they're moving. But still really, really sparse. You know, I can't imagine having a drive just looking at that. Um, okay, so then there's this, this, again, this awesome sensor, as I mentioned, this Velodyne. So the Velodyne is basically like, you know, so the sick, it sees in a, in, a, in, a, in a plane 180 degrees. Now imagine taking that and flipping it vertically. Now I can see the stripe this way, and then rotating it around. So now if I do that, I can build up a, real, a 3D point cloud. I'm going to do that 10 times a second. 15, 15 times a second. That's what the Velodyne is. But this generates a lot of data, so a million points per second. So when we need algorithms that can try and hope to process that in real time, there are also issues in terms of communicating all that data. Um, and so 96% of, the, of, the, of this was used for obstacle detection. Um, yeah, it's basically 64 lasers instead of 164. Let's spin around. So I'll show you what this looks like. This is, I think, driving around Harvard Square. And here's just a, a collection. I think this might be just one sweep, maybe two sweeps. That you get from the sensor, but you know, compare that to what the lidar, the, the planar lidar is. You really can see right away. There are trees, there are cars, there's some people walking around. What are the colors? So these are what we can say false colored by height. So red is higher, blue is is, is lower to the ground. Is that Just indication all, of height. Is that false coloring communicated to the car? Yep, yep. So it has all that. It basically, so what it gets is it gets for each one of these points, it gets its, its 3D position, its x, y, and z. <coughs> The red the color is an indication of the You can see here, so over, you can see this person crossing the street here, a bunch of people over here. So it's an excellent, excellent sensor. Much easier to interpret, at least in principle. Yeah? It's an effective short range. So you can see that there is actually a dead spot around here. So there is some range limitation, partially from the vehicle, but the sensor itself does have a minimum range. I mean, I don't recall what it is. You know, it's in maybe half a meter or a meter. But because of the because of the vehicle including it, it was roughly about three meters from the vehicle. It was blind, so that's why we rely on the lidars around the vehicle. Can it, does it GPS coordinate? No. So what you what it does is it just gives you it gives you data in its own reference frame. So we have so that's the part of the part of it is a big challenge of this is calibration. So we have all these sensors reporting data in their own reference frames. And in order to interpret them, we need to bring them to some common reference frame. So what we need to do is we need to estimate basically the transformation that takes the data from one reference frame to the vehicle's reference frame. So that's what that's what the challenge of calibration. So figure out exactly, you know, basically you can imagine going with a measuring stick, measuring exactly where it is on the car, that gets you within, you know, maybe a couple centimeters at, at best. And then you have to estimate the, the attitude. Um, and what, but once you can estimate that, we have some routines for doing more principal routines like that. We can now project everything to a common reference frame. So all of this was projected into the car's reference frame. So we don't. We actually were very deliberate about not projecting it into a GPS reference frame. And I'll show a video of why that can be detrimental. We're all we're interpreting all our data relative to the cars, relative to the cars reference frame. That's because that's sufficient for what we call local navigation. If I know that I want to go over there, all I care about is all where the obstacles are relative to me, not where they are on Earth. So we have those. But the, the problem with those, both of those sensors is that they have a fairly limited field of view. Do I show it on the Velodyne? I think it's around I don't, 50 meters. I think it was actually a little bit. In, 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 in practice, we get a little bit more than 50 meters. But let's say 60 meters from that, around 80, maybe 90 from the SICK. But if you can imagine being at a, at a T intersection where traffic is coming in 30 miles per hour, that's not sufficient necessarily, depending on how quickly you can accelerate, to determine whether it's safe to turn into traffic. So we used another sensor, these radars that have actually been used for a while excuse me, in cars for adaptive cruise control. So we used Delphi sensors. We had, say how many we had? We had 16. We had 16 of these. So these are sensors that see a fairly narrow field of view. I think it's around 18 degrees. They can see, and they, but they can see far, you know, over 100 meters, <coughs> upwards of 120 meters. So we had 16 of these mounted on the vehicle. Here, I'll show you some of the data that comes out of this. So this data is a little bit you know, cleaner in some respects. It's going to give you the indication of an object, and it's going to give you some estimates of its velocity. And it's going to try to track it over time. So each thing it sees is given, a, it tries to give it a unique ID. So that between time t and time t plus 1, it's going to give you the correspondence. This is the same thing that I saw one time step. It's, it, but it's not at all perfect. It's very noisy. Things will drop off, half pop in, it gets spurious, spurious returns. You can see it's estimated these, these lines here indicate its estimate of how something's moving. 
or you can see it gets several returns from that car. But we have routines for cleaning them up. So we have all this data. You know, some, in some cases, they get developed. I have a lot of data, a million, million points per second. It's very noisy. Most of it is not useful. We need to pull out what is useful, get rid of the noise as much as we can, and reduce it to a much smaller representation that we can actually do inference on, that we can actually do computation. Again, we have this GPS antenna on the roof. We have these wheel encoders that basically just tell us how, you know, how many times the wheel is how, how many times the wheel is moved, turned in a second. We use that for what's referred to as dead, reckon, dead reckoning. Okay, so how does the system work in practice? So I'll talk about you know again. The most, is the most significant challenge then, and I still think now, is perception. So I'll tell you about some of our perception systems. And I'll go into some of the finding as we go. So this is a, a very high-level view of our system architecture. So we take as input this USB stick. That gives us this MDF and the RMDF. Those are just MDF is mission data files. So that's the points that we have to go to in the environment. RMDF is the map. So we get that as input. And so what we need to do, there is this high-level process uh, that figures out one where we are, so the state estimation. So where are we in the environment? So if I need to go to an intersection that is a particular latitude and longitude, where am I relative to that? So that gives me a goal that might be you know, hundreds of meters away. So where are we? Given that, what does the environment look like around me? That's the perception change. So in particular, where are the obstacles? Where are the potholes? And where are the moving obstacles? And where do I think they're going to be moving in over the next 10 seconds? Where are the vehicles going? So given that my understanding of the world, roughly where I am and where I need to be at a course level, how do I actually get there? So what's a path that I can follow that's one, and most importantly, not going to collide with anything? But second, secondary, you know, almost as important, what, how, what's the path that obeys the rules of the road? Right? So I can't drive off the road unless I really, really need to, and we had some mechanisms that, that would allow that. I have to obey the rules of the road. Basically, that's what all these processes here are handling, and then they all send data in the end, just steer, gas, and brake data. This is a zoomed-in view of system architecture. So we have multiple components. I think there were probably uh, 50 or so processes running on board on, across on, on the cluster. Most of them devoted to processing all of this data, but also handling things like motion. And so I'll talk a little bit about the perception piece first. And as I said, I think that's probably the most interesting problem. Talk about some optical detection. I mean, optical detection we relied on two modalities, so these LIDARs. So that was the SICK LIDAR, these planar LIDARs, and then this, this bell and height, the spinning sensor. We also use radar to detect stationary optical. The bell and height and the radar, the bell and and the LIDAR we have used to detect hazards. So hazards again like potholes. Well, again, there was no extreme potholes that we couldn't drive in, so things we wanted to avoid, but we could drive them in them if we really needed to. They were traversing. We use cameras for now let's, let's consider the problem of doing obstacle detection. So again, this is the vehicle. Nope, no, I can't parse this, but this, I want to say this might be Harvard Square in Boston, not the course. But anyways, we have, the, we have this scan from the Veladon. And the goal is to convert all of these point clouds to a much more compact representation that's indicative of possible obstacle locations. So the way that we do this is, again, you know, we have a series of processes. And basically what we want to do is we want to do what's referred to as clustering. So I have all these points, and I want to group the points together that correspond to the same object. And the way that I can do that is what's referred to as spatial clustering. So notionally, points that are close have a high likelihood of being part of the same object. If there's a gap between points, they're probably part of separate objects, right? They're really intuitive. There's also temporal clustering. So if I thought these points were part of this object at time t, then they probably are part of that object at time t plus 1. So more specifically, is the motion of these points consistent with what I think the motion of that object is? So that's temporal. So grouping them uh, by using temp time temporal cues. And the challenge was we want to do this as fast as possible. So very low latency. You know, nominally, you know, if we, if we were doing this 100 meters per second, oh, sorry, we had 100 milliseconds, and the vehicle is traveling 15 meters per second, that's, the vehicle will have traveled 1.5 meters. So that's a significant distance, particularly with regards to ob objects around the vehicle. So this has to happen. And so we want to do this in a way that is redundant, right? Because sensors can and often do fail. Um, we had that happen. The sensor becomes occluded. So you can imagine driving off-road with all the dust and mud that's flying up. It could block a LIDAR, and a LIDAR has blocked its uses. So we need to be able to mitigate sensor failure. We also want to be able to deal with you know, uh, 
false negatives. Or we, are, we don't want, rather, we don't want the false negatives. We can have false positives. We don't want false negatives. I don't want my sensor telling me, oh, there's nothing there. You can drive forward in reality there's a car. And that happens with some of these sensors. You have a very black car absorbs the signal and you don't actually see it. So that was the motivation for pitching these sensors down. So if we pitch them down, if we don't see anything, and if the sensor tells me I can see 80 meters, the max, whatever, 90 meters the max range, that's a cue. Because it's pitched down, it should have at least hit the ground. That's a cue that there's something there. It must have absorbed it, you know, it must have absorbed the, the light being emitted from the system. The way that we do this again, we have multiple systems that have a fairly, you know, maybe reasonably low false positive, positive but very low false negative. What's, what's an example of this if someone's seen the sensor redundancy? So let's say our car is driving, you know, driving around and there's an obstacle in front of it. So there can be a rather the sensor we look at. The sensor reports that there's an obstacle in front of it. It sees something five meters away. So that could be that there's an obstacle, in this case, you know, a traffic cone in front of the vehicle. Or it could be that you know that the ground is not exactly flat. You know, this is not in the Midwest. So the ground may, you know, there are hills. So it could be that I'm just seeing a hill. You know, a hill is fine to drive on. I don't want to hit this, this traffic. So what's one way we can detect it? An obvious thing, you know, at least seem to be fairly obvious, is let's just put two sensors offset with parallel planes, by an offset by you know, 15 centimeters. Now if they both see the same range, there's probably an obstacle there. If they don't see the same range, if there's some discrepancy that's consistent with a, a maximum slope of the terrain, it's probably terrain, it's, it's fine to drive. That's one of those we can to, to One of their motivations for having redundancy. So what we do is, get, we have this notion of, you know, I don't know who came up with this name, but this notion of chunks, and I guess it's fairly uh, descriptive. So what we do is we, we take these points and we group them again, using the spatial cl and temporal clustering, into collections of regions that we think might be parts of objects. Not necessarily objects, but parts of objects. And we want this to be, and these chunks, they only have to last for, you know, short, you know, four hertz, 0.25 seconds. So these are, we took all that dense point cloud, we threw out ones that we know are on the ground, and we collect others that we think correspond to chunk. Vehicle. So this, the good thing about this, we take a large amount of data, you know, one billion points per second in context of a Velodyne, to a you know, much smaller number, a thousand, what ends up being a thousand chunks, versus actually really is more like a million hits per second. So now we have we have an we have a, 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 a amount of data that we can actually re, re, reasonably process using more sophisticated algorithms. So sort of like what people refer to as coarse coarse defined. Let's reduce the data as quickly as possible, and then we can spend. Now we have a much smaller, more compact representation. We can afford to spend more time doing more sophisticated processing. So we do that. Now we're trying to again do a little bit more clustering to group them into really more cohesive units across more not just for you know 0.25 seconds but for longer periods of time. It's more proximity based. So these color, the colors are indicating points that we believe correspond to the same object. And it doesn't get it perfectly. You know, see, these are actually, this, this isn't harness, but these are people. We didn't have people in the environment. Sometimes it says it's the same person, sometimes it says they're different people. Some objects get segmented into multiple objects. Um, it's not perfect, but you know, it's, it, it, it's, it, it's accurate enough then we can now start to predict not only where stationary objects are, but where dynamic objects are moving. The next thing again is to now track these over time. So this is more, this is doing the temporal clustering. We track them over time, and we want to estimate their velocity. Again, for a moving vehicle, if I know if, if there's a car, say, turning, there's a, when I'm at an intersection, there's a car coming, if I know how they're moving, I can predict whether it's safe to try to, if I can beat them, or if I should go around them and behind them. So to do that, we need some estimate of how, you know, where they're going to be in 10 seconds from now. Yeah? The obstacle, the obstacle versus the obstacle example, what if the obstacle has the same special geometry as the control? Then how does the, uh, how does it work? Yeah, so exactly. So if you have, so we are assumption that was that obstacles are essentially vertical, uh, where we can differentiate between, the, at least the slope of obstacles is significantly more than that of the ground. <coughs> so if we had some obstacle that was, you know, with slope as much as a ground plane, the car would probably would, would try to drive over it. Um, so, you, know, you may not want to put, you know, things like, you know, there were an, you know, animals running around or something. Like that. Um, but really, that wasn't the case. Because really, it was, it was, it was, they put big K-rails uh, in people, for example. They didn't have people, but you imagine people could be discern a person. Other vehicles, etc. There was no discrepancy. There, there was no inconsistency. 
They were not consistent with the ground. Yeah? In case of downhill, does it decrease the speed or it just continues the same speed? Good question. Downhill, we just continue the same speed. You can imagine that there were there, there were some. So let me rephrase. There were some. So this is all just in terms of the perception. The, the planning and control piece was moving over, was reasoning over which paths are dynamically stable. So if it was downhill and you were taking a turn, that would reduce the speed because that would reason over the fact that I can't go fast downhill and turn because there's a good chance that I'll roll over. So in that case, it would slow down. But if I'm just going straight down, it would continue. Sorry. How does it detect a downhill? So that, that's a good question. So some of that you can detect with these push room sensors. So you can detect. You have these sensors that are seeing the ground. We have an IMU, so especially when you're on when you're on a downhill. If you're coming up to a downhill, you're, if you're at the top, you've like a cliff. Say, let's say a cliff. Driving through a cliff. That would be difficult to perceive. I mean, this, the push rooms would see that they, they just don't see anything, so we would stop. Once you're on the hill, you can use the IMU, it tells you the orientation of the vehicle, the pitch in this case. You can use that, and that gives you an observation of the, the pitch, the, the slope of the ground. Of the ground. Mm -hmm. The what, sir? The yeah. yeah. Here, you can see this now. You'll see, we work, so it will actually start to track people, and it gives you, you see these flashes of light. That's an estimate of how fast they're moving, so this thing is it's moving around five meters per second. You see some other vehicles over here. So this is doing the temporal cluster. So now this is something we can actually start using to plan with. You see that some of the people were bouncing, were bouncing in and out because we had some assumption. Because of sensor, so we, you, sensor noise can sort of suggest something is moving, right? So these points are going to be moving around a little bit, right? They're not perfect. So that could either suggest that something's moving, uh, or they could suggest that something's moving. Right? So what we did is we had a threshold. We said that because there are no. Can you hear me down in the back? Am I talking loud enough? Yeah. Okay. So, so yes, we have this threshold. This is okay. Nothing's going to be moving. There are no pedestrians in the environment. Nothing's going to be moving faster than or slower than one and a half meters per second. So that's why we saw some of this. Some of this flashing it's part of it. It's just moving too slow because so it's a stationary object. It just there must be some sort of And then actually that went on to bite us. Uh, just some visualization. You know, because we have all this calibration, you know, we did a lot with, with, with analyzing data. So we did a lot of testing, collecting data, and re replaying, replaying our data, rerunning our algorithms on log data that was very integral to, to the algorithms we developed. Um, so this is, this is part, of the, so a part of the calibration. We can now start to visualize data from multiple reference frames. So what we're doing now is we're projecting our obstacles that were estimated in one reference frame, the vehicle's reference frame, onto one of the images. This is the forward frame, basically. This is the wide, the wide field of view camera. So we can project them. It's so very useful for us just looking to see what's going on. Because our vehicle would do something, you know, you're watching it, or you're in the, we did all our testing in the car, and it would do something, you know, erratic. What caused it to just stop? And why did it swerve? We didn't know. What we would do is we had to walk everything. We'd go back and just read through the data, visualize it, and see, oh, well, it hallucinated something in front. That's why it stopped, and that's why it swerved. Uh, yeah, so I'll get to that, I think. I'll, I'll, this will know where to the radar because I don't know. Uh, we'll get to that in a bit. Okay. So again, we did some curb detection, uh, in part because some roads didn't have lane, make, lane marks, and also as, a re as another redundant observation of the lane curve. So our lane detection wasn't perfect. It's going to make mistakes. So the best way to deal with that is just to have a redundant estimate of our lane curve. So we did it again. We took the, this sensor that's the Velodyne, and we use this, and you can, you can imagine now if you just look, you can start to pick out where the curves are. So these abrupt changes in height are indicative of some rough, some change, you know, this change is indicative of a possible location of a curve, particularly if we know an estimate of the ground height. So we can just search in areas that are near where we think the ground is, and we can start to fit curves. So that's what I'm showing here. So these, these yellow points are possible locations of the, of the curve, and what we did is we fit curve of the curb, 
and we pick curves, these lines, to these. We give some parameterized representation of where we think the curves are. And then we would feed that into our, the algorithm with the, uh, the output of lane detection that would try to figure out how the road structure evolves. Next is the lane tracking. Okay, so this is lane tracking. Get a number of pieces. So the simplest, so what we, what we did at, at, the, at, the, at the lowest level, we, so we take an image from one of the forward facing, and we actually did this with the rear facing because it's useful to predict where the lanes are in front of you. You have some estimate of where they are, where they are behind you, actually. Right? Because they, the, cur the, there's, the curve is, they, 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 there's some family of curves in which they evolve, uh, so it's useful in any case. So what we did was we just tried to again. There's a lot of you know we don't want to we don't have the computational resources, or we didn't at the time to process an entire image. So we want to reduce the amount of data that we have to process. The simplest thing we do is we can say well we have an estimate of where the horizon is based on our estimate of the ground plane. We know lanes aren't going to there's not going to be road paint in the sky essentially. So let's throw out that part of the image. Let's only focus on where we think the ground plane is. So, you know, so that's what this red line is. So what we do is we do a very, very simple filter that runs on the image, basically looking for uh, uh, changes in intensity. So we run this over, and this fires. So that's what these white markings are. Locations in the image where there's a significant change in intensity. So we do that. That's a very noisy observation, but it's some signal. So that's what this video is showing you here. So you can see here on the, on the left, you can see the lane evolving. You can see a little bit on the on the curve it actually fires, but it's also firing on, I don't know what, some trees or some garbage on the ground, some noise in the road. Um, but there is some, again, there's some useful signal and if we can pull it out. And so that's what the next step is. Can you say intensity, intensity what? Image intensity, the pixel intensity. So the image is, we get an image, it's an array, it's an array of data, each one has an intensity associated with it, RGB. Um, Yes, exactly. Yep. yep. How complex are the issues of multiple autonomous vehicles in one space with all this RF energy flow? Yeah, so that's a good question. So that's what people were worried about, you know, about all these these, these sensors uh, uh, affecting one another. Um, you know, one LIDAR get, receiving the, the, the beam from another LIDAR. People were concerned about that. In practice, that didn't happen, not at least not to our car, and I'm not aware of anyone else having it happen to them. Um, and to be honest with you, I don't know why. That's not my, that's higher than my, that's beyond my expertise. Uh, that's right, it's a physicist maybe. Um, yeah, it, we, people suspected that it could be an issue, but empirically they found that it wasn't. And that's the best thing to tell you. What about things like sandstorms or rain? Yeah, yeah, so those are all good questions. So, yeah, so if there's a sandstorm, these, these systems are hosed. So what it's going to do is it's going to stop. And that's, that's so like, I'll get to this later, that that's really is a big challenge to, to self-driving cars, um, is that people do a great job. You know, when it snows, you know, people slow down, but they're able to navigate. You know, maybe a few more, you know, a few more accidents, but people do a really good job. You know, getting a car to do that, a robot to do that, is a really, really hard problem. We don't know how to do it. Um, here, we didn't have that. Um, and we did some testing in the rain. It's able, you know, these sensors can deal with some rain, you know, to us, it just looks like noise, and so our system is used to being able to filter out some noise as it is, so it's able to mitigate some of that. But if you were to take this in a torrential downpour, a sandstorm, it's, it, it's not going to work. How about fog? Probably wouldn't face it. Yeah, so fog, fog is that's another, that's a good question. So they make LIDARs that actually are designed, like I think nominally designed for adaptive cruise control, that can see through fog. And basically, essentially how they work is they send uh, a redundant series of beams, so that some beams may reflect off the fog, but other beams may see through it. Um, so yeah, we did. We actually had one for a little while. We didn't have it on the final car, uh, but that's yeah. It's a really dense fog. That's that's a good question, uh, especially with vision. Right? I mean, there's nothing. Do you have a fog tolerance policy? A fog tolerance policy, for example, if one sensor goes down. Yeah, so that's a good question. So we do, there was a, so at the lowest level, you know, there was a very, very, um, uh, very, very uh, redundant set of redundant safety measures. 
that were running on the vehicle. They were monitoring the status. So we were monitoring the status of every different sensor, every different process. And we had a set of rules, again, this was designed by hand, that says, you know, okay, so the first thing is if the process is estimating your pose fails, stop. Because if you don't know where, if you don't know where you are in a local reference frame, you can't track obstacles. It turns out you can't track obstacles. If you can't track obstacles, we're going to hit something. So we just come to a safe stop. Um, if some, we, had, we had some rules that allow us to mitigate. We couldn't, again, we, we deliberately designed it with redundancy. So some sensors could fail. So we had some sensors fail. The vehicle could, see, could still proceed. You know, one thing it might do is it might modulate its velocity, slow down. Yes, yeah, so we were watching every process to see what happened. I think that's an interval that's essential. Okay, so now what does this look like? So we get all these, these these noisy intensity readings. Now can we can we take those and start again like we did for curves, fit parabolas, and more specifically fit what's known as B-splines to these to these uh, curves. So that's what we're showing here. So what I'm showing with these green circles and the what was the white line is the notional model of the lane structure, just that we get from the map. This intersection here, the other intersection's over there, I'm going to assume that the lane is straight. What I'm showing in the cyan is our parabolic fit to these intensity grades. And you can see it's noisy, right? You see the lane, it's estimating that the lane is jumping. But it's a much, again, much more compact representation. It's more stable, you know, we've, we've gotten rid of most of the noise, there's still a little bit of noise left. So now what we, we do what's known as filtering, so specifically using a common filter, we a common filter to now maintain an estimate of the lane structure, the parameters of this parabola. So that's this here. So we have the car here. The car is going to be driving over to the left. The map says that there's a straight road that goes from this intersection to that intersection. So that's what we'll start. We'll start with that as our estimate. And as you'll see, as the robot starts to navigate, the, ro the road really just is not a straight line segment. It actually curves, and the system estimates that. Cyan are the, I know I'm showing now, the filtered estimates of the road structure. Yellow are the, the fit to these, the intensity grid, the changes in intensity. And the vehicle is able to estimate now that the road actually curves. Using this case vision, but we also are curve. Is that yellow or So that, that, so that, would, would that give us? Wow. <laughs> I, I talk too much. I talk too much. Um, I'll just talk loud. So we have to. What this gives us is gives us a model of our environment. So now what we need to do is I know you know I, I have some, I now I need to know the map. The, the emission file tells me that I need to go to the intersection at you know Vassar and Main Street. I know what's around me locally. You know maybe upwards of 100 meters around. Me. Obstacles are. I know where other cars are. I have an estimate of where they're going. So I have an estimate of where they're going. How do I get to the intersection of Main Street and Vassar? And that's the goal of navigation. So notionally, the model, our model for navigation, is very simple to how a person navigates. Right? It's this high and these pieces that handle high-level navigation and low-level navigation. So global, we refer to as global and local planning. So there's a global planner, analogous to a GPS system, that gives you course directions. You know, drive forward half a uh, sorry, half a mile, and then take a right on Vassar Street. That gives us basically a carrot that we have to drive towards, and we have this low-level controller that's now finding a feasible a local sorry a local planner rather, and saying now that I know I need to go you know half a, half a mile forward, what path should I follow, such that I follow the road structure, I don't hit obstacles, etc.? That's this local planner. So this local planner talks to this low-level controller. The thing that's saying, steer, this, except this is your steering angle, this should be your acceleration. And that's basically what we have. So our global planner is just doing graph search. Very simple, it's very similar, I imagine, to what a GPS is. I have some structure of the road. I know where intersections are. I know whether the lane, I have some estimate of whether the lane is, uh, the road that goes between these intersections is closed or not, or if it's one way, the wrong way. I want to plan a route through this graph, through this topology. So we use an algorithm that dates back, you know, several, several decades known as A star. Very simple, but very effective algorithm for finding paths from point A to point B through this topology. 
Oh, this works for now. Right? Let's see. Yes? No, there we go. Okay. Okay, so that's that. So the, the high level, again, is this global planner we refer to as the navigator. And what it's responsible, again, finding routes through this topology, through the map, but taking care of things like intersection precedence, uh, who has the right of way in terms of a stop, right? Because these stunt drivers would do that. They would pull up to this intersection at the same time, right before you. So they would have precedence. So you'd have to let them go. Um, whether or not how we can pass. So if it's a double yellow, we can't pass. If it's not if it's dash line lanes, we can. And we also had some mechanisms that says, look, you know, things are not going to be perfect. There are going to be stoppages. DARPA was willing to let you drive across a double yellow if it meant progress. Right? So we had a traffic jam, right? the first robotic Sure, it was the first robotic traffic jam where 15 cars backed up. So they would allow you to say, you know, forget it, I'm going to you know, go around there, I'm, I'm going to turn around. So this is a view of just a movie of the navigator running. So you can see it just, this is driving around our map, and it's, this, these are the routes that it plans, the course routes. So just giving us a series of intersections. Go to this intersection, then take a right, then go to another intersection, take a left, etc. This is just showing it as the vehicle's driving around in each of the a parking spot, etc. Okay, so that gives us a goal, but now what we need, now what the planner needs, it needs some, again, model of obstacles, and how do we represent that? We use what's known as a, as a drivability map. So if any of you have heard of what's referred to as an occupancy grid, basically we take our environment, let's say, um, 100 meters around the vehicle, and we discretize it into a bunch of cells, 10 centimeter cells. We assign a, a value to the cell that expresses the cost of the vehicle being at that location. 255 means you can't drive there. Zero means it's safe. You go there no problem. And so what we do is we assign, first assign maximum cost, some, some version of maximum cost, to areas that are outside the environment. The place that actually would be, it wasn't quite maximum cost because we, we could go there. The vehicle wasn't making progress. It was actually allowed to say drive on the sidewalk to turn around. Uh, Maximum cost, though, at obstacles, we cannot hit anything. And then we would dilate them a little bit. We say our sensors aren't perfect. You know, maybe the obstacle isn't exactly there, so let's try not to get too close to it. Or if we do, let's slow down. Other cars, where we think other cars are going to be over the next 10 seconds, et cetera. So that gives us a model of the environment, obstacles. And my navigator is telling me, well, the next waypoint that you have to go to is half a mile ahead. So we, we throw that into the drivability map, and now what we need to do is we need to actually find a feasible path. So feasible meaning something that the robot, can, the car can drive, right? The car can't move sideways. So a path that's feasible that doesn't hit anything, given our model of where, given our map of where it's okay to drive these costs. So again, we use a, we use an algorithm. This one dates back to late '90s, built by a professor who's now at University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign called the Rapidly Exploring Randomized Tree. This is an algorithm statement. I think it's 10 lines. It's a ridiculously simple algorithm, but very, very effective. So how does it work? So let's say the vehicle is here. I want to go to that blue location. That's the, that's the intersection that's half a mile in front of me. And I want to find paths that are feasible and collision-free and do it as fast as possible. Because we're doing this all the time. So the way that we do is we sample so what happens if I treat this as a carrot? You think of a carrot in front of a horse. I stick this as a carrot in front of my vehicle, and I have it try to drive there. We had a good model of our dynamics, so we can simulate, say, if I try to drive there, this is the path that I'm going to follow. If I can't turn arbitrarily, so I'm going to follow this path. And we say, well, is, if I were to end up there, is that safe or not, using our drivability map? What is the cost that's in that cell? So in this case, it would be this high cost that indicates you, know, you could go there if you need to, but you shouldn't if you can avoid it because it's off the road. We repeat this process sample another one. Do that same a simulation. Again, in this case it's in the other lane. If we can avoid it, let's not drive there. We repeat this process. We sample one over here. There's a simulated path that goes there. That's safe. Okay, so that's valid. We can drive there. Then from that point, we sample another one. We try to grow it, as the name suggests. It's a tree that rapidly explores the environment. So keep repeating that process. We know that we, we know that we can go to this top green circle there. That's still feasible. It's close to the yellow, but it's fine. 
We keep repeating this process until we get a path to the goal. We throw out ones that are on top of obstacles, as the, 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 the green circle on the, on the, on the gray uh, box is. And that gives us the path. So here's this happening in practice. And what we do, the environment's changing, right? Because it, maybe in one second we didn't detect an obstacle that was there, but we detected it the next second. So what we do is we, constant, or we constantly replan the vehicle's path to make sure that the path is feasible, that, that, that we're following is feasible, but also to find maybe there's a better path. So this is, that's why it has to be fast, because we're running this at you know, 10 hertz, let's say. So what you'll see here, this thick yellow line is just a straight line segment to the next goal. And what you'll see these trees generated very quickly, showing, showing the algorithm searching for paths through the environment that are feasible and collision free. So you can see the tree building. It's a little bit difficult to see, but there's this bright yellow. That's the current estimate of what it's, what it's following. You see there's a white sequence, that's the sequence of carrots. And so that's the next waypoint there. It's gonna hit it, once it gets close to the waypoint, the navigator says, okay, well you made it to the that intersection that's a half a mile in front of you, here's the next intersection that you have to navigate to. So it starts planning there. So it's planning, you know, roughly, you know, up 20 to 50 meters ahead of the vehicle, depending on the speed, depending on the environment. And as I say, constantly replanning. So it's going to get to this parking lot, it's going to slow down, it's going to plan another path to the exit of the parking lot. This is if I can tell. How does it determine speed? Sorry? How fast, how safe, how fast it can drive? Yeah. Yeah, so that's a good question. I didn't mention that. So the map that it gets says for each road, here is the speed limit. So 35 miles per hour. So it's using that. It's not reading any stop. So we're not doing any reading of speed limit signs or stop signs or anything. The representation that we get tells us exactly where the intersections are, where the speed limit is, etc. It will lower its speed if it feels like it's not safe because of obstacles, but it won't exceed it. Yeah? Does it take into consideration the lane signs? If you have to turn left, you have to stick it to a specific lane? Yes, exactly. So it does it. So if it's, in a, if it's in a two lane road and it knows it has to take a left, it's going to try to go on the left hand side. So do you take that from the map or the signs on the road? That, that's off from the map. There's no reading of signs. Okay. So then the question is, okay, we have this, we have, we're able to perceive the environment, or we think we're able to perceive the environment, and you know, reduce what is a large amount of data to something that our algorithms can actually process, and do so in a manner that's re re uh, robust to s sensor failure, uh, robust to false negatives, and we can now take that representation, we can start planning and steering the vehicle in a safe manner, but at the end of the day, does it actually work? Right. So it's cool to show videos like, you know, maybe it's cool to show videos. But if it doesn't actually work, you know, we're not going to get the prize, right? And that was, you know, not, wasn't our, really wasn't our motivation, but, you know, $2 million is, 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 is tempting. Even though I don't think you would have gotten it. So, um, so does it work? Yes, I would say. So they had the competition, and again, this is, seems like ages ago now. Uh, November, early November 2007. So they started with, like, with 89 teams. So DARPA had a series of qualification rounds to try to reduce it to a tractable number of teams that they can actually field in a competition. It ended up with 11 teams in this course in Victorville, California, so outside of LA. They had 50 human drive driven cars on the course. Again, all the robotic cars were out there at the same time. They gave you three mission files, placing you in each of the list of places to go. You drove around 60 miles a time. So of the 11, six teams finished, five were eliminated by DARPA, kicked out for not driving safely. Uh, so collisions or successive delays, they said there was this traffic accident. It was the one that ended up being the house. Uh, they were disqualified. <laughs> Luckily no one was in the house. So we came in fourth. So we were both, right? Third place got half a million dollars, fourth place gets zero dollars. But we were happy, right? Because one, it was the first competition we had done. We had never driven more than 20 miles in a single day before that day when we drove 60 miles. So we are really happy. We had never interacted with other robotic vehicles. Um, and our system drove safely. So safe, each car had a safety driver. They thought our vehicle was always safe, maybe too safe, maybe it was too cautious. So the teams that won were a little bit more aggressive. To that, to that I, we were involved, I think, is like the first autonomous car accident in history. Um, so this was us with the team Carola, which I believe is from Germany. I don't remember now. Um, Again, just, you know, I think both cars just got confused. I'll play this video here. 
Uh, let me actually read the bottom. So, so what's happening here is this is like a dirt parking lot, and so our vehicle on the on the left or the right rather is trying to make navigate to this waypoint that exits the parking lot. And you can see the car has detected these obstacles here. There's some estimate of maybe where, where it thinks the curb is. That's the green here. Um, but it is estimate this. You can see um, that little blob below the circle. That's an estimate of where an, an, another object is. In this case, we our car thinks it's stationary. It's, really, it's not moving fast enough to exceed our threshold. So we're going to plan around it. We do the stationary object. So we start planning around. You can see our RRT planning a path here. The cars are moving ever so slowly. So again, our algorithms are constantly replanning to make sure that the, the path that we have is feasible. So its car starts replanning. It says, okay, well, the only way to go is to navigate this tight space between the vehicles. So we're going there. That white circle means stop. Like, we're going to hit something. So we stop. That other car kept going and hit us. <laughs> so they were disqualified. Uh, fortunately, the Olin team put this huge bumper on our car. So we could hit practically anything and, didn't, so, and, and not damage the car. So we were all right. In this case, our sensors were fine. Um, they were, fortunately, they let us proceed. So that's the first bot-to-bot -bot collision in history. Um, and the next is the second bot-to-bot -bot collision in history. So this was with us very near the end of the road race. This was with us with Cornell's team. So what happens is we're pulling up to a rotary here. You can see in the images, in the center image, that's a forward-facing. You can see Cornell's car, I think it's like this GMC Suburban or something, new car. So they're stopped. So we, they stop, we stop, and we sit, and we're like, we wait a little bit, and we realize that they're not moving, so what we're going to do is we're going to pass them. We don't want to stay there forever. So we, we start to pass them. And once they stop, we treat them as a stationary obstacle. We don't remember, you know, the logical thing would be, that's a car. I probably want to give it a wide berth because there's some probability that they could start moving again. Our AI system is fairly dumb. It says, okay, well, it's, it's just a blob, of, some blob. It's not moving. I can get reasonably close to it. So what's going to happen, you'll see as I play the video, we start to go around it. And then what happens is that Cornell starts moving very slowly. But so slowly that it looks to us like sensor noise. Remember, we have this threshold. that it's moving above, below a meter per second, we'll just say it's, you know, we'll just say it's sensor noise. So we didn't treat it as a moving object, and we ended up colliding. But very, you know, I think we were driving, you know, half a meter per second at most, both cars. So you can see it's planning around. This is the waypoint that it wants to go to. Now it says, forget it, I'm going to plan around it. So that's this path that it's planning. It's a little bit, it thinks it's a bit of a tight space there. It plans around it because it doesn't want to go off the course. And you can see, if you look, Cornell's wheels start to spin. So I'm trying to play that again. Yeah, there we go. So if you watch the image on the upper right, as we start to pass it, pass it you're going to see the wheels on Cornell's vehicle start to turn ever so slowly. Yeah, they start to turn. They go when we hit. Very slow. Um, honestly, DARPA said it was not, it was not a, it was a no, what they called a no-fault accident. So fortunately, they let both teams continue. This is actually where we lost a camera. The camera failed on this. Um, but they let both teams finish, or at least continue in the, in the race. And, and Cornell did finish as well. Yeah, so, so really, what's next? I mean, this is very, very early stages. You know, we've got a system that can drive reasonably around this urban, really suburban environment with no people, perfect weather, no sandstorms, no snow, no fog. Um, drives very, very slowly. Um, we had, we had the, the people from Myth, I don't remember the names, people from Mythbusters who were broadcasting the event. And they kept making fun of MIT's car because we have all this data coming in, and we, we did have, we can be aired on the side of, False positives versus false negatives. And our car would be driving, and then it would see something. It would just stop. It would sit there for a while, and then it would start driving. Um, so it wasn't at all, none of the cars were perfect. But really, it was, I think, the, what DARPA did was a stepping stone, I think, certainly now, to what you're seeing today. What you're seeing today. Uh, you probably, maybe many of you are familiar with this, but there are, you know, people speak to a countless number of benefits to to having self-driving cars. You know, one you know, the most significant is probably safety. So you have you know, over five million vehicle crashes per year. I think what I've heard is that that's equivalent to a 747 going down every day, I think is what. I think the math that's up. 93% um, of them have are, are humans at fault. So the idea is that we get people driving, we're robots drive better than humans, they don't get tired, they can react in principle, they can react faster. We can significantly reduce this number from three ways down 30,000 feet. So yeah, 35, that's the number, 30,000 fatalities is about, it was 1747 going down a day. 
Um, other benefits, just in terms of efficiency, right? so people are people have done models and say that in self-driving cars there'd be you know, much less congestion. You now have time that you could use not for driving your car, but taking a nap or whatever. Google has this video of people playing up with a trumpet or something in one of their cars. Um, reduce the need for parking, etc. Number a number of benefits, better fuel efficiency. So where are we going? So after the urban challenge, you know, so that was 2007, we had a meeting like 2008 um, just to talk about, you know, for an afternoon, people were just chatting, you know, talking about where do you think it's going to go next? You know, what, when are we going to, one of the questions, when do you think there's going to be a car driving the streets of Thomas? And I think like the mean estimate was 2040, 20, you know, 2050. And then a few months later, Google announced what it was doing. So Google again was started, Google X was started by Sebastian Thrun, who was the leader of Stanford's team that won the second grand challenge and was, I think, second place in the Urban Challenge. He went to Google and started a self-driving car project. And, you know, I think the rest is essentially history. So every, I think everyone here is familiar with what Google has done now. Every, you know, every, everybody in the automotive industry is now involved in self-driving cars. Um, so more recently, you've probably heard of this, um, it's called the Koala car, and that's what they call it. But this car, again, meant for city driving where the speed limit is only 25 miles per hour, it's supposed to be very safe in the context of collision, so there's some give in, in, in the body panels. Nominally, or initially they said there's going to be no steering wheel or gas pedal. I think they, they reverted on that and they had to put one in for now. And the sensor on the, oh, sorry, I should, should go back. So I mentioned the big, uh, Velodyne being prolific. So a lot of what Google did for a long time was using by, the Velodyne as their primary sensor. So you can see the Velodyne on the roof. They have other sensors on the vehicle. Uh, but the Velodyne is one they rely on significantly. They've since now started making their own version of a Velodyne, which is there now. Uh, but a very widely used sensor. Um, so again, they're testing these in Austin, Texas, as well as around in Silicon Valley and San Francisco in particular. These Koala cars. Um, or around in California, I should say. They have 23 SUVs, 25 of these prototypes. There have been, again, this is actually an update. There were this was as of July 2015. There were 14 accidents, none of them caused by the autonomous vehicle. It turns out that's actually not true anymore. There's one that was caused by the, the vehicle itself. Uh, what they don't tell you is how many times so they're, all these are ran with one safety driver and another, at least one other operator. So they don't tell you is how many times does the person have to take control. But it, it's amazing what, what Google has done. And really other companies as well. So this is just a video of an accident. You can see this is a data, this is a visualization that Google has. So visualization is key. So you can see that car behind it just rear-ended the Google car, this little purple circle. So again, that's where they think all the other cars are. Boom, just rear-ended it. So that was not their fault, it was the car, fault of the car behind it. But more, more recently, this is February 14th, I think it was, yeah, February 14th, there was an accident in, in California um, where this vehicle hit a bus out, out uh, in Mountain View. Car hit a bus. If you go on Google, you can see there actually video from the cameras on the bus. Very, very minor accident. Like basically, I think most people on the bus barely even noticed it, but still an accident that was caused by the vehicle itself. So I think for the sake of time, I'll let this play. This is just a video again. Google has a visualization that they have, uh, showing how they interpret the road. They're able to now. That again, so we didn't read any street signs. They're doing this. That's that's really imperative, right? Because they they're not operating in a controlled course. They have very detailed maps of the environment that they use. But they're also reasoning over the environments are changing, right? They'll someone will start doing construction. So they're able to read construction signs. They detect pedestrians, uh, bicyclists. They can detect hand signals on a bicyclist, et cetera. It's, it's really impressive what they can do. What is the difference, like what you said, they're developing their own Velodyne thing? What do they have there? See, that guy don't know. Um, I don't know if it's publicly available. Um, I would, yeah, I, I honestly, I'd be making it up. I would guess some of it is certainly financial. They can, they can control the cost. The Velodyne has some issues. It's a noisy sensor. It's certainly not, a, not at all perfect. So I'm guessing that they can they get a, make a better version of it. Yeah, so again, there's a lot. The reason that, you know, one of the reasons we're getting into this is with all those advantages, there's a lot of money in it. So this article from uh, 2013 says so the data now saying that there's trillions of dollars in. In, in, in self driving or semi self driving cars. Uh, and to that effect, so Toyota, the motor company, just put a significant fraction of a billion dollars to start a research institute, Toyota Research Institute in California and Cambridge, to explore, among other things, self driving or 
autonomous vehicle technology, semi-autonomous vehicle technology, so active safety being one of them. There is now ten billion, estimated $10 million spent over five years on development. Uh, this is a visualization, it's a pretty cool location in, 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 in Ann Arbor, Michigan. So University of Michigan does a fair bit of work with Ford, so Ford is, is a research lab in Ann Arbor, and they developed this test. So one of the biggest challenges that we had was with testing. So at the time, you couldn't take a self-driving car on, on the road, even if there was a safety driver. So we had to go to an old naval, naval airstrip, put flour on the road, on the, on the, on the runway to mark lane paints, you know, um, and to navigate, to drive around. So Ford and, 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 and University of Michigan and, a few, and some other collaborators have built this city-like environment, 32 acres, where they can start testing vehicle technology autonomously on private land. Tesla, so you all know that Tesla is, is amazing. So I talked to people about Tesla, I think, two years ago, and they said they were going to start working on self-driving cars like this, or self, something towards self-driving cars, and I thought, that's ridiculous. How are you going to do it in two years? And, and they have it. You can, buy, you can buy a vehicle now with autopilot. Now, I've not done it, I mean, I've not been in one, but I've heard you know, pretty good things. And so this is a song, and this other article, it's not. Um, but yeah, so again, a lot of people are getting in on this, and I think this is probably, a, a, I'm sure this is a small fraction of the companies that are working in some way, shape, and form on self-driving cars. You know, you know, of course, Google is doing this. As I mentioned, Toyota has put, you know, in several hundred millions of dollars towards it. NVIDIA, the gaming company, has put a lot of money towards self-driving cars, among other things, making you know, GPUs as processing, for processing data. Mobilize, an Israeli company that they're actually one of the first to start addressing some of the perception challenges. Is actually, Mobilize is used in Teslas to do a lot of the, again, in a lot of the perception tasks. Everyone from automotive companies, again, I'm sure you've all heard rumors of Apple working on a self-driving car. I don't know, I've heard mixed things that it's not happening, but um, I wouldn't be surprised if Apple is as well. Yes, again. And City, I mentioned, so, so what are the challenges? So we talked about some of the things. So this is a video in, 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 in Boston near Fenway that was collected. What you're going to see here is the light's going to turn red. So if you have a system that's looking for red light or green light, you're using it to figure out where to go. You can say, okay, it's green, it's safe to go. But the challenge is that is pedestrians. People jaywalk all the time. Pedestrians, you know, are, you know someone says, what's it called? People are the ultimate source of uncertainty. You see this, the light's going to turn green. Pedestrians gonna, two pedestrians are going to dart in front. You have to detect that 100% of the time. Or as close to 100% of the time as possible. That's really, really hard. Here's another video. So this is again in Boston. And what you're going to see here, it's nighttime. The light's going to turn green. If you look here to the left of the car, you can see it. there is a, a, a cop there. And so if you watch it, what the cop's going to do is the light's going to be green. But the cop's going to let some pedestrians cross and tell you to stop. He or she is going to stick their hand out, telling you to stop. So that's what maybe five by five pixels in the five by five, by five window of pixels in this image, and you have to detect. That's all that matters now. Nothing else in the image matters. Those five by that five by five window man, matters, and you have to detect that. So you'll see. Watch. Boom. Green light. No one at that point was in the intersection, but you have to stop. That's really really hard. That's why I was saying perception is really one of the key challenges. Okay, so sandstorm. So, <laughs> so this is again, this is again Boston. A lot of my images are from Boston. Uh, so this is Boston. It's the salt. I think it's the salt pepper and Longfellow Bridge, um, taken from in this case a pedestrian. But you know, people are again are very good at driving around streets like this. What do you do? There are no lane paint. There's no lane. There's no lane paint. There probably aren't any curves. How do you figure out where to drive? Well, people do a really good job. This you follow the car in front of you. You look for ruts in the road. No one has really started to think about this in the context of self-driving cars. I mean, Google, what they've done is extreme, and the other companies have done is extremely impressive, but this, it doesn't snow in Mountain View. It doesn't snow in Austin, Texas. You don't have to deal with this. Um, and again, not, and again, I don't want, I don't want to, um, I don't want to downplay what they've done because it, it's, it's amazing. But you're just saying this is real, this is a challenge that we really have to solve before we can start selling self-driving cars. I mean, you can say that you can use this car in areas where it can't snow, but it's not allowed to cross state lines. Um, that's not going to be feasible. So yeah, big challenges going forward. So building and ma maintaining maps. So with, with the competition, with the with our team in the competition, we relied very 
loosely on maps. Otherwise, we're just relying on mobile sensing, analogous to what people do, right? So you, people navigate really well with a course map. People oftentimes get in trouble when they try to act, navigate based on a very detailed map. Like the GPS tells you to turn right, and someone turns right and ends up in a pond. We're very good at just course maps. Tell me rough direction of where to go. I can navigate. I'll avoid obstacles. But a lot of these systems now are relying on very detailed maps. So that's a big challenge, building and maintaining these maps because environments change. Dealing with adverse weather conditions, dealing with pedestrians and people in general, bicyclists. Uh, and so Google has this video of them, actually, as I said, detecting the bicyclist. Um, actually, there's one, I think, in Austin, Texas, where they came at the stop sign at the same time as the bicyclist, and they, it, the Google car detected it and let the bicyclist go. And the bicyclist went, but we started playing with the car and would stop. They played this you know, sort of this cat and mouse, to who's going to go, for a long time. I think later on the car got a ticket, I think, for driving too slow. got pulled over by a cop for driving too slow. Um, anyway, so more testing. Really, data is the key. You know, in our little, in, in our, what we did, you know, was, was, was trivial then. Google is going 10,000 miles a week. Maybe, actually, I think it's like 1.4 million miles that they've driven. It's a lot of data, but processing data is, is, is critical, right, to, to find those rare events, those, those events in the tail in the hand you know, in front of you. Other issues like validation. So you have systems that have millions and millions of lines of code. How do you validate, how do you give a certificate, basically a driver's license to the car, to know that it's safe now for the car to navigate? That's a big question. We don't have answers for that. Yeah? So, I mean, like, you've seen a lot of companies investing in this, and you listed a lot of challenges. But one thing that I do notice is, like, what about the issue of security, encryption, and, like, can someone access all the data? Can yeah. someone basically drive your car for you yeah. that you don't want? So. How do you, I mean, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so that's a big issue. Okay, yeah, so, so, so the issue was, you know, we talked about a lot of challenges, but what about what about security? So there's been, a, there's been uh, news stories, I think, over the last six months or so, maybe a little bit longer, about people hacking into cars. I actually heard another story about someone supposedly hacking into a, an airplane, in like, you know, a commercial airline, through the entertainment system. So that that is a real issue. So security is certainly, an, is, is, is definitely an issue, particularly with, with, with um, when you have, thousands or millions of vehicles on the road. So I don't, I mean, that's, that's not my area of expertise. I know that that is certainly a challenge that people are thinking of and, and focusing on, um, but I don't know much beyond that. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Mm. So the question is, do we only interpret use computer vision techniques for detecting lanes? So we, we use images, but we also use other sensors, so namely the, the radar, but sorry, the LIDAR. So we use these point clouds, like the Velodyne that we get, to look for anomalies on the ground that are suggestive of where curves are. And you could use other cues to do this, like if you had some way of detecting grooves, say, in a snowstorm, that's suggestive of the road structure as well. Yeah? Yeah, so, we, so the data, it, it comes in in a variety of different forms. Um, so we had a tool that, it, it basically a tool that we developed that defines various data structures that we, that, we, that we use to represent our data called LCM. Uh, the LCM is also communication. So the big challenge here is how do you represent the data and how do you communicate the data? Not just in terms of bandwidth, but in a, in a, in a time efficient, you know, I guess we'll leave it there, in a time efficient manner. Because we have, was it 10 computers with 50 different processes and they all need to share data. In real time. So how do you share data? How do you define and share data? So we have this tool, as I mentioned, called Lightweight LCM, Lightweight Communications and Marshalling. What it does, as the name suggests, is a very compact, lightweight method for marshalling data between processes. Um, so that in that we define a variety of data structures that we would store our data in. And we have to be smart about it because the Velodyne data is a million points. So we can't just chunk that into one data structure and share it. We have to break it up into more manageable chunks and send that around. And that's another area where we get into redundancy. A question about your uh, point about software validation. A lot of times developers like to use uh, different development frameworks, agile frameworks, Scrum. Do you feel that um, because of what's coming with autonomous cars, in fact, there's, they're a really large engineered item that a lot of those frameworks will radically change at this point? Or do you think that's we're still kind of ahead of the game and trying to figure out how to, sure how to fit IEs that? in particular? Or? I'm, I'm, IDEs or um, just like in like just in general, I know like Scrum is 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 been popular. 
I'm not familiar with Scrum. Um, Scrum is when you have a um, group of developers and they're kind of in these short, um, and forgive me if, if I'm not getting this accurate, but, it, but for development what they do is they're kind of listing out just in general a sort of framework of how something should work and you have, are, you're on this very short schedule of developing bit by bit by bit. Yeah, but okay. um, for an automobile, there's, you, know, you have to have durability, you have to have some miles put on it. And I was an engineer at Ford for eight years, so I kind of know that. So you think that there may be some... I think it's probably a balance between, yeah, I think it, it's certainly going to change. It's certainly going to change. Um, so, you know, I'm more of, I don't know, a hack. I'm not really a good, I guess, or principal software developer. Um, we had some on our team that were better in that. So we had things that we would do sort of analogous to that were we call this storyboarding. So we would come up and say, here's the problem that we need to address. How can we um, modularize that into more tractable different chunks? And we, we would break that up across the team and we give you a timeline. And you're responsible for the process that reduces um, this dense point cloud to these chunks. And you're responsible for converting these chunks to um, spatial clusters. And someone else is responsible for taking those to the core. Um, I imagine that the, the way of software development is, is, I imagine it's going to change. Um, but I think that in many respects, this parallels a number of other complex systems. So in terms of validation, you know, one thing that people are looking at is how the airline industry validates and say, that their systems, right? Because they have systems that are very you know, equally as complex. Again, the environments maybe you could argue are not as complex. Um, but systems with millions of millions, millions of lines of code that people have put a lot of effort into coming up with ways to validate. Um, so we'll probably get into the influence from the argument. Thank you. Well, all of the sensors you described are visual. Do you consider using other, you know, like sound sensors, yeah. smell sensors, touch sensors? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so sound probably would be would be a valid would be a valid cue. Um, no, we have we honestly we didn't even think about that. And in a roboticist in, in robotics, people are not. So they primarily use lidar because lidar we know how to deal with. Vision is really hard to parse an image. We start, to, we are doing that now, but we're, you know, this level of sophistication of you know, mm -hmm. a one-year-old, maybe at best. Um, those are really the, the, the two modalities that we've been focusing on. But yes, exactly, sound is another cue. Um, language, so I do my research, a lot of my research involves, involves language. So how do you, you, know, you can see audio in many respects, but how do I, how would I speak to a robot? So you can imagine for a car, how would a person tell the car where they want to go? Oh, you know, take me to the, you know, take me to the, um, the restaurant at the intersection of Larrabee and, and the North. When you said, you know, when humans drive the snow, we often navigate by following the cars in front of us. Is there thoughts around sort of how, you know, having the cars be able to communicate or data from yep. yeah, so the question is, you know, is there is there is there work on vehicle to vehicle communication? So we have all these cars navigating there would around. Be some sort of standard. Yeah, exactly. So people are working on that. And I think part of the problem is standardization. So I think each you know, different companies have their own standard. Uh, I know Ford has one. Um, it's an area that I'm not very familiar with. Um, but it's some of the work that my advisor is doing it. And my team before this was working with Ford on vehicle to vehicle, vehicle to vehicle communication. Because yeah, that's going to be integral. Vehicle to communication as well as vehicle to infrastructure. So now imagine you can start talking to the lights. And the lights, rather than trying to perceive where all the lights are, they can tell you if the light is red or it's green. Um, you know, maybe it solves some of the perception challenges. Yeah, obviously, yeah, exactly. Study the driving patterns and improve it. So say again. We, we study all the data. We keep the data. Or you keep the data. Oh, we keep all the data. So, so we log. Have, we have terabytes and terabytes. Some of this is actually. I mean, if you want to look at the data, some of it is publicly available. You can email me. I'll send you the pointer. The URL. I don't remember off the top of my head. Some of this is publicly available, so you can start visualizing and viewing the data. No, we keep everything. Um, so is it used for the next time to improve the driving patterns? Yep. Exactly. So we, you know, I think it's not probably as sophisticated as, you know, we say regression tests that other people would do. But what we do is we, we log everything, and particularly when we see some anomaly, when the vehicle didn't behave in a manner that we expected it to. We can now go back and play the data, and we, our, the system is structured in such a way that we can play that data and run our, our algorithms as if they're running on the real most of them, not all of them. But uh, run, actually we can, we have, we have a simulator. So we can run all of them as if they're running on the real vehicle. 
So now we can see, we can look in, you know, we have our visualization tool, we can sort of reach into the pro to the process and see what it's doing. And you know, that will allow us to do that allows us to do debugging certainly, and then we can now tweak the algorithm. We can say, okay, well, it hallucinated an object there, maybe that's because our threshold on, you know, um, how close things are clustered is, is too small or too large, etc. And we start tweaking our parameters, modifying our algorithm, and then rerun the data again and see how well it worked. And then run it on other data as well to make sure that it wasn't just a unique event that it's actually you know, affected by the more general. And so that was a big a big part of it was logging data and processing data. Because we can learn a lot. It's a lot, it's hard to run the car, especially when we're running it autonomously. It's much, much easier to process data and run it and, and analyze data rather. Yeah, so I think, I think exactly, so, good question. I think, so I think a number of things. So we, you know, we were very sensor heavy, so we probably put more sensors on it than we needed to. So I think that's one, that's one piece. So we could have gotten by with you know, maybe half the number of sensors. Um, so with that, you don't need as much computing resources. Computing, but computer, computers have gotten much more powerful than they were, you know, 2007. Um, I would say probably the, the two of those. I don't know what, honestly, I don't know what Google has in their car. I mean, I've seen some of Ford's cars and, you know, they basically have, you know, basically a couple of desktop machines in the trunk, you know, much, much less than we have, and they're still able to process the data. So I think the algorithms are more efficient. People have a much better idea of what they need in terms of sensing. They don't need as much, so they can get by with fewer sensors, fewer, you know, terms, fewer computing resources. I think it's probably the biggest change. And then NVIDIA would argue that, you know, what's been done with GPUs is allowing us to you know, process things much more efficiently as well. You also add upon that too as well. There's a lot of the um, automotive computers are now using like the big data processing in the cloud. There's a lot of like cloud computing technology that you can upload the data to yeah. your cloud and then you get it back and actually reduce. You yeah. have to have all your processing done locally. Exactly. So you may, and for that, but you have to be very careful. You know what goes in the cloud. Obviously, safety critical stuff can't go to the cloud because you, know, you use Siri, and if Siri doesn't have a connection, it doesn't work at all, right? You don't want your car to do that, right? You, know, you can't talk to the cloud. I can't detect obstacles. But if there are other things that it can't, you know, maybe it can't find. Maybe it tries to do navigation, and it can't find the that, you know, it goes to the cloud. That's going to give it the fastest route. Connectivity drops. It has to resort to some onboard, uh, much simpler algorithm. It's not, it's not going to find you as good of a path. You take a longer path, that's fine. Uh, yes, exactly. It's about, I showed this video last time, this, or this, this image last time. Um, you know, a lot of it's just learning from experience, right? These events that are in the tail. Probably not around Mountain View, you're not going to encounter cows, but you might not have to go too, too far. You see these cows driving, you know, walking down the, down the road, learning about what to do, figuring out what to do. Um, yeah, so. With that, you know, I'll, I'll take any other questions. So, do you have any very different strategies to navigate when a car being taken? So, you outlined uh, the strategies you use with the waypoints and the pathfinding. Uh, is it all been refinements of that to your knowledge, or are there some really new innovations in the approach? I, I think it's, it's probably a little bit of both. Um, so I think, as I was saying, so what Google does is they're very heavily reliant on maps. Maps. So they have prior maps of the environment that solve some of the perception challenges, right? Because if there are static obstacles, so they don't have to estimate necessarily the lane structure because they have very detailed models of the, of the environment. Um, static obstacles, you know, light poles, they're all there in the map, they're there. I don't have to worry necessarily about perceiving them. I still have to perceive other ob obstacles. Um, I think there's, but certainly many, many changes, the algorithms have changed. Some of them are, you know, again, I'm, I'm speculating to some extent, like to, to a large degree. Some of them, you know, may be, you know, incremental, but many of them are, are more significant. Um, and, and I think one of the biggest advantages now that you're seeing is the advent of, you know, machine learning, you know, tools for quote unquote big data. So our system involved, you know, very, relatively little machine learning. But machine learning is critical because we have 1.4 million miles driven, I don't know how many gigabytes that is a second, you know, 50 gigabytes a second. Even. Google has a ridiculous amount of data, and other companies have a large amount of data. With these machine learning algorithms that have you know come over the last five years, particularly with deep learning.